Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Public Works Finance Committee of the Moscow City Council. Meeting on Monday, August 25, to my right, Council Member Dan Carscallon, to my left, Art Betke, Council Member, to his left, uh, Gary Reedner, the City Supervisor, and I'm Walter Steed, City Council President. The first item of business is approval of the August 11, 2014 uh, minutes, and you have been handed a one that was adjusted from the one that was in the packet, and also reapproval of the July 28, 2014 minutes. Uh, the reason for the reapproval is that someone in their wisdom decided the chairman of these committees needed to sign the minutes. Um, <laughs> the first time I was asked to do that, I just signed it. The second time, I thought I'd really read them and uh, made a few changes. So uh, those are before you for approval. With the changes, I'm okay with approving them. I'm okay with the second set. I wasn't here for the last meeting, so I can't comment on that one. And I'm, a, I'm okay with all of it, so we'll consider them approved. Stephanie? Okay. We'll come back later. Item number two, Tom Grundon to talk about the Hamilton Low Aquatic Center parking lot repair project. That Thank you. Fixing to occur, I think. Thank you, Chairman Steed. Uh, City staff for the last couple of years has been observing the parking lot outside the HLAC, uh, certain areas of it failing. And as a result, city staff recommended and the city council approved a budget item for this year of $49,000 to make repairs at the said parking lot. Uh, we went out to bid, received three bids on August 15th with a low bid from Motley Motley in the amount of... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, $38,291.30. Uh, the project call, calls for the removal and installation of approximately 830 square yards of asphalt concrete pavement, including the installation. Uh, and then we would reinstall four inch perforated subsurface drain pipe, subgrade separation geotextile fabric, and crushed rock base in the parking lot areas. Uh, so that would remove and replace several different sections of the parking lot that are currently failing and uh, would be done here at the end of September, first part of October, after the close of the pool for the season, and the parking lot will still be accessible throughout the duration of the uh, construction work. Uh, city staff at the completion of the project will then restripe the parking lot where the work will be done, and we're currently funded at $49,000 for the repair work uh, in the budget, and as such, not knowing completely the scope or condition of the subsurface out there, we may have additional areas to repair or put additional uh, drain tile in there because we have a lot of weeping water that comes up out of the ground and has caused some of the damage there. So that was the reason for the request for up to a 25% in change order allowance per year approval. With, with the city's luck, <laughs> on the last several projects at what they find under asphalt in this town, I hope 25% is enough. What um, happens if it's not? He'll be back. He'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was looking, expecting, and, and don't think we have a map of what areas are being done. It's not the entire swimming pool parking lot, is it, Tom? No, not at all. Uh, it's, and it was in your pack it in the, the, the booklet, but it's right down the middle of it, Walter, and certain area to the south, and then there's a long three-foot area up on the north side, too, uh, that's failing. So all the areas that are marked with the red crosshairs are the areas contemplated for repair. Okay. So no new um, asphalt going up out there where there's gravel, where there's currently a gravel. That's correct. This is only replacing existing areas that are failing. And all, all basically right in front of the pool. That's correct. Does anyone have any idea why that barely wide strip on the north side is being is failing? Uh, what, what is that? Four feet wide? It's about three feet wide. Three feet wide. That, that's and, what the saw would be. The entire east-west length of the mm -hmm. of the of the uh, of the lot. Correct. Anybody idea? Any have any idea why? Mm -hmm. 
Someone told me one time, if nobody says anything, just wait, and somebody eventually will. <laughs> I don't have the answer to that, but we'll probably know when we excavate it. Okay. So there's it's probably... Un it's unusual to see something like that, isn't it? Yeah, it is. B um, but based on, as you mentioned, what we found at uh, Mountain View Park with asphalt right over clay subgrade, uh, we, we'll see when we get there. You're never surprised anymore, no. are you? No. <laughs> okay. What are your wishes, gentlemen? I, I'm, gonna go, I'm okay with going ahead and forwarding this. As I said before, you know, is 25% enough? Prob probably. Hopefully. If not, Tom will be back. So I'd, I'd look forward to approval. Yep. And I'm good with it, too. Consent agenda, Gary? Yes, sir. Thank you. And with your permission, I'd like to give a shout-out, if I may. Go ahead. Well, I'd like to thank Scott Bontrager and Kevin Lilly and Jason Leffley of the engineering department for just being a great asset to the parks division. So it's great to have a nice team to work together. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Gentlemen, I suspect he's buying coffee the next time you all I'll go out together. <laughs> Um, okay, next item is a monumentation agreement, Ridgeview 2nd Edition Subdivision. Ron Crumley is bringing this to us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The uh, developer of the Ridgeview 2nd Edition Subdivision is preparing to file his plat uh, with the county recorder's office once we're done with our review. Uh, the requirement the state requires all interior and exterior monuments of all plats to be in place at the time their the plat is recorded. Um, in order to avoid losing most of the interior corners during construction, the state also allows for only the exterior monuments to be set and the interior monuments to be set at, at a later date, normally within one year. Uh, to keep those uh, monuments from being destroyed. Uh, the only uh, the only way that's allowed is if there's a, an agreement in place, and in this case, it'd be with the city. And uh, the deposit is is uh, presented by the developer to cover the cost of setting those corners at a later date. This is our standard monumentation agreement we do with all subdivisions. Nothing, nothing out of nor the ordinary. So, do you guys have any questions? Just one quickie: um, the one-year time frame is that from the date of the plat or from the date of the start of construction? It's usually the date of recording the plat. And if if there needs to be uh, an extension, they also allow extensions to set that date even farther back if they need to. Is it following up on that? Um, it strikes me that quite often that one year time frame is not met because plats are recorded and construction isn't started sometimes for a year or two. Does that, I mean, <clears throat> I, mean I understand that maybe better than the requirement that they be set within a year when the construction hadn't been done yet. Um, Salisbury's whatever addition, I think, has been platted for quite a while. The market conditions have not led to constructing it. Um, there may be some others. Um, are we creating a rule, Gary, or somebody that, that really, in, under ordinary circumstances, might not be met? Or is, is that state code and we don't have any choice but to write it this way? State code requires the monumentation. <clears throat> the one year <clears throat> the one year is in there so that it doesn't go too long before they're done. If it is delayed, then we do bring extensions back in. But the idea is to have them set as soon as possible. So it does cause a little more work if they aren't done exactly when the subdivider thinks they will be done. However, it allows us to essentially be assured that they're going to be put in in a reasonable period of time. Which is what we want. You bet. Could we not, what, what if we made it a shorter period of, t period of time and <clears throat> pegged it to construction in some fashion? I suppose you could do that. Um, 
I guess I would rather see uh, council delegate the monumentation agreements to the city engineer. City engineer then could enter into them without bothering the council with the detail and then could monitor the progress and extend those as necessary. And that's something, if you're interested, we could bring to you if you'd like. Well, this doesn't come back to this level when there's an extension, does there? I mean, I, is I that with the engineering department? I, I can't remember any. I don't any, remember an extension. Any yeah. extensions that have come to here. So uh, that's kind of how we work right now. Must be. I can't remember. <laughs> Tell you the truth, I'm not aware of any that have been extended we're just that were brought back. We're questions until we got to don't know out of here. Well, you can keep asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one of those processes. It's a pretty lockstep process. So, um, so why do we need to see these? If it if it's you by, don't if it's by statute, we have never said no. I'm not. I don't want any monuments. Yeah. yeah. Well, the idea was that any contract that's brought through is brought to council unless it's very minor. Uh, this, because it involves real property and a subdivider, we brought them to you, but we'd be happy to have that delegated to staff. I think it'd be a good idea because it's routine housekeeping agreements. Okay, well, why don't we, we can certainly add that perhaps um, in a future, just bring the policy to you and you guys can... Let us know if you'd like to proceed with that. Um, I guess, Mike, how many monuments are we talking for this this entire subdivision? I couldn't give you the number. Does it? I mean, is it tied to how many lots there are, or or how do, how does that work? Well, the exterior monuments, which defines the boundary of right. the plat, they have to be set by law. Um, the interior monuments are are each lot corner, mm. and. In, Depending on how many lots they have, it's so it's plus plus center lines of curves yeah. in the streets and all that. Right. Okay. So there's several. I mean, it's it's not a, just a once once these certain houses get built, then we we can be done. It's it's each one basically has to be. Locked. But the agreement is set for the entire subdivision uh, to be done at once. Um, and with once everything's done, basically, because you couldn't just piecemeal it in it doesn't seem like it it it'd be more expensive than the 2100 yeah, bucks it's up to the developer and the, and the surveyor if, if he wants to come in and set the pins that have already the lots have already been built on he's he's able to do that mm. well, i'm okay with moving this forward just okay. like every other one me too with the stipulation uh, let's look forward let's look, look into yeah. it yeah okay okay good center agenda yes sir yes. okay thank you Mr. Tyler Palmer has come back from vacation or wherever he went and he's going to talk about talk about a right-of-way trimming policy yes gentlemen thank you um, I think you'll recall we were here before this committee previously to discuss our right-of-way trimming um, I, I can recap the program as much or as little as you'd like me to um, the basics of the program is as it's recap the what we were doing right what brought up the question so and your thought process and how you got to where you are we, we have our, our annual trimming process in which we go out we take one area of the city we notify based on some feedback from residents we started notifying in the fall and then also so people would have a full season to do the trimming as appropriate we come back in the spring notify two weeks prior to the trimming um, and we wanted to get this in policy so that it was something that that we had that, it, that the council had had a chance to have a look at and and so we had that backup um, the, at that time the committee gave us the direction that they w wanted to see an option presented for payment a payment option um, there is an expenditure of funds by the city to make this happen payment by the property owner. by the property owner <laughs> by the adjacent property owner for the trimming that is conducted so we went back to take a look at, at what that might look like, and that's what we're doing back here today is presenting um, a policy that incorporates um, a payment option with, within the trimming. So in the policy you have before you, it, it basically has the, the same layout for the trimming process as far as we, we have the certified streets crews by our city arborist in proper trimming techniques. We go out, we notify the notifications, let people know what the standard is, what the policy is, and that we would like them to perform the trimming and let them know when we'll be there. Um, 
as we looked at options for potential billing, um, you know, s some of the things that are, that are obstacles within uh, a billing system is just the logistics of doing the billing. It's, okay, so does the street true get an address and then document the hours and they come back and does that get sent to finance or to ordinance enforcement and does it have to be by certified letter in order to be able to bill people and to be able to, to levy a fee. There's a lot of those things that, that have to be worked through. Um, as far as the the billing amount, the vast majority of the sites that we've seen, we estimate about 95% of the sites that we trim take an hour or less. And when I say that, many of those are 20 minutes or less. It's, it's we're pulling up. People have tried to get into compliance. There's a limb here or there. Or they didn't quite understand what the site triangle meant, and we're doing some very minimal trimming. We wanted to avoid penalizing those people and really try and make it so that it's the ones where we have a disproportionate expenditure of staff time and resources um, and, and target those for um, reimbursement to the city for that, that time. Tyler, I'm probably being argumentative, but the property owners are responsible for this by Absolutely. ordinance. Yes. We're not penalizing them. We're, we're, we're doing for them what they are required to do. I understand the small amount of work part. I get it. Mm -hmm. But it's their responsibility. It's not ours. The city ordinance says it's their responsibility. Absolutely. And, and I think you've brought a good program to work the, work the community you know, in, in quadrants to try to get compliance. Uh, you and staff could work yourselves to death chasing the city attorney to get him to cut that limb, and he may never get around to it. Um, but uh, welcome to the table, Rod. Thank you. Um, but it's, I don't see it as penalizing them to be doing for them. I, 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 I agree. I, I think that the thing that we considered as we formulated the program is we have to look at the reality and the logistics of operating the program. And so if, if the fee, say it is the $130 fee that's applied, which is based on a two-man crew and the equipment that they use, um, if, if we pull up to a place and it's a 15-minute location, A, trimming people's trees is something that they're not always typically super pleased to have done regardless. But by the time we run it through the process, it was felt that, that, that the monetary gain, that the, the, re, the reimbursement the city might get, we might expend more than we're going to get back. It it would it's it's going to cost more by the time we document it. It goes through finance. If it, you know, Rod could speak more to the notification requirements, and then it goes, you know, the follow-up and potential liens on property. It seemed like we would be maybe opening a Pandora's box for not, you know, stepping over some dollars to pick up some dimes. Now, just add, that's why I came up. I was going to talk about you have to give notice to the property owner before we start the process of enforcement, give them an opportunity to cure it before we come in and do it. And like um, Tyler said, probably costs a little more if it's under an hour than stuff that's a larger job, I think, than the... Um, but, but the process is laid out in the packet meets those, those necessary requirements. Yes. So... We've we've come up with the amount. The, the the dollar amount is based on our our staff. Like I said, staff time, equipment use. Um, a lot of the uh, the equipment use is based on the FEMA equipment rates, and so it's a pretty recognized national rate. Um, and that comes out to one hundred and thirty dollars an hour is what it costs for us to have a crew out trimming. Um, and so the that was that's that's what is in the current policy as proposed, and that was what we put together based on the request from the committee to come back with. A billing option for the program. What? Let me. Uh, if you're talking about the last bullet in the in the policy, right of way vegetation trimming policy, and you are verbally telling us. Okay. You're verbally telling us that that is a crew consisting of two that, that's a two-man crew and then the equipment necessary to necessary yep. for them to do the work right okay um, Gary I would think that if this is if if this is approved it becomes a written policy that the crew should be defined in that lower that last bullet 
Mm -hmm. In other words, you could put 20 people on somebody's yard and get done in less than an hour, and if, even if it was a whole lot of work. So I would, I would personally like to see some definition of we could come up what with makes a, up what makes up the hours worth of work. Are you talking we could about come up with a cumulative two two men a half hour piece is an hour, or mm -hmm. two men for an hour is an hour? That yep. kind of thing. Yes, sir. This hundred thirty dollars an hour. Where where will it be? I mean, it's it's not in this policy. Is this going to be in the fee schedule for the city? Yeah, the, the thought was that, that that would adjust as you know equipment rates. FEMA adjusts equipment rates, and as our rates for keeping our you know our employees are constantly adjusting. And so, the, the thought was to to have it passed based on and set a fee and have the fee based on certain criteria that then change. And then it would we would look at it annually as as we look at the as part the of the fee fees, resolution. Yep, as part of the fee resolution. Okay. Um, uh, Gary, uh, yeah, is this uh, this isn't included that. in the fee resolution at this point? No, it is not in the current. So fee we resolution. would not be charging it until we open up the fee resolution. Right. Uh, since it's a new fee, a public hearing will have to be held for it. And could we do it before spring? We could, and there may be additional fees that we look at as well. But um, certainly, we would need to. I should have stayed. No, I was I was looking for Rod before Rod was looking for us. And if, we, if you don't do it as a, f um, a fee based, um, if you can do it by reimbursement, because they whatever the city expends to do that, we can get that from the homeowner without it being necessarily a fee. Yeah, you could you could put it in place by ordinance, and by ordinance you can seek reimbursement for services provided, just as we have for our sidewalk ordinance. Is that in the current ordinance? Regarding trimming or, or or obstruction of, I don't of believe so. I think it might say reimbursement. I'd, I'd have there to is something check in there for obstruction of the sidewalk in there. Sidewalks, yes. We, and so we can, so we can do something similar to that. Yeah, with this. We, we'll have to research it and find out. But but right now we're looking at policy and not necessarily tree term and ordinance. I mean that 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 would be the difference. Yeah, we can <clears throat> go ahead and take a look at it and bring back an implementation plan as well and give you some options I mean I like the idea of, of having it because you know how many times do we go out there and we're just doing it because nobody else is and somebody's getting the good out of it that and it's not the rest of the city mm -hmm. yes sir. so I just had a broader question it says that the city is divided into annual service areas how many areas do we have uh, for the purpose of this service and many of the th services in the streets department, it's divided into four areas. So that means once every four years, once every four years, we come back around. around. Yes, unless you get a complaint. And and yeah, and and, and as, as is called out in this on uh, complaints that when it's not the year that that is it, that is up for rotation, then those are sent through ordinance enforcement, and ordinance enforcement then runs through the process. I'm okay with it. I, I mean, I would like, like I say. We don't have the the dollars in here, but I want to see something somewhere with the dollars. When in we, here. we what we wanted to do today was run the concept by to see if this was something everyone was okay with, and then we can put together an implementation plan to say, okay, this is how it happens, and these are the nuts and bolts of the thing. Okay, so you're not looking. So this doesn't necessarily for this to go that. on to council next month. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So Gary, let's let's do those at least three things that I can remember. One, better define what makes up the hour in terms of manpower and equipment. Um, Staff and power. work out some way to capture that hundred right now 130 whether it's sure. through fee or the current ordinance or does an ordinance need to be changed or something to make it get possible okay. I, I understand the more trouble to build than to do the work kind of thing um, I want to think about whether or not the hour is where I'd like to be on right. this um, as I say, and the city attorney hadn't corrected me on this yet today, this is a requirement of the property owners by ordinance. Um, we're providing a service to do it for them yes. because we want the city cut. I mean, I've got some areas that I walk that you single file to walk down the sidewalk, two of you, because two of you can't get through without one of you going through the bushes. So it's a good plan. It's something that needs to be done in whatever fashion we end up deciding to do it. 
That's along the line also is snow removal. When people don't shovel their sidewalk and we have to come in and do it, we could actually bill them for that too. How do we do that? What's the billing mechanism for that? We do, I think law enforcement ordinance provides notification, um, ordinance enforcement, they provide notification to the homeowner and they put a notice on it and write a notice and tell them that they need to have it cleaned up. Or, um, or the but do we center. bill it by fee? It's the done fee by ordinance, ordinance or do we do it within the ordinance on the snow removal? Go ahead, Stephanie. What? Just write in the ordinance at cost. Yeah, it's it's done through the it's ordinance. It's in the ordinance. Yeah, it's an enforcement means. Okay, so is it? That's an option here. It sounds like. Yeah, we don't. I would have to check to see if we've ever had to do that. Usually, letting folks know is sufficient. We had an issue about three years ago and during a term of heavy snow snowfall. And at that time, if you'll remember, we actually got volunteers in the community to assist. But usually they're contacted by code enforcement or the police, and people generally they get it taken care of somehow. Yeah, the other issue that you run into, it's not so much the um, snow removal, although that's a seasonal issue. It's broken sidewalks, things like that, that our ordinance uh, puts the responsibility for repairing those sidewalks onto the adjacent property owner. There have been property owners come before you in the past, and typically that's one of the reasons that we have a uh, sidewalk program now is the council's been reluctant to tell someone that, you know, if they have a street tree that's heaved a sidewalk, that it's the adjacent property owner's um, duty to get it fixed. So we've dealt with that in a different way. But we can bring back some options to you. Okay. Anything else? Nope. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Okay, Scott Bontrager has got the pavement management program, the 2014 grind mix pave change order. Speaking of things people find under asphalt in Moscow. Or, or what they don't find. Or what they don't find, yeah, as exactly. the case may be. Good afternoon. Uh, brought before you today is the change order number one and should be the only change order for this year's pavement management project, the grind mix and pave project. This change order comes to you associated with additional work that needed to be done out on the Adams Street section of the project, which was Adams Street 3rd to A, and then the F Street portion, which was on F Street from Lincoln to Hayes. Both those stretches of asphalt, we found differing subsurface conditions or conditions where we had an existing concrete roadway underneath. and. Uh, these particular surprise yeah exactly these particular conditions led to us having to strip off the majority of the asphalt out there and basically rebuilding large portions of the roadway bringing in extra rock on F Street and uh, out on Adam Street basically digging it back down to subgrade and building up for a new roadway but the change order presented to you here kinda lays out in general the work that had been done and what was being requested by the contractor to make up for the the extra work that they had done out there um, Scott how much roughly uh, of that 21,350 was on Elf and how much was on Adams I mean, those are the two streets we're talking about yeah, right? probably about a quarter to maybe a third was on F Street okay the majority of it was on Adams. Was on Adams. Yeah, and Adams actually required additional work while we're out there. We installed a new water line on it while we were there. We also installed two new sewer manholes that were old brick manholes while we had the street torn up. So there was additional work that was benefited by having the street torn up. Okay. Just an accounting issue through my inability to read spreadsheets as well as others, but. Uh, it says 21000 in the request, but then when we look at the original bid price at 6600 it dropped the total change order to fourteen seven. but then we're back to twenty one somehow. Could you walk me through that thread? Yeah, with this change order, we also remove a bid item, bid item number four, which that item was associated with the shape, mix, and compact of the asphalt grindings that were originally in the project. So the original scope of the project was to basically grind up the asphalt and mix it in with the base. Without being able to go through that process, we've essentially removed that bid item since that work was never done. So of what's being asked in the change order, we're also removing bid item number four, which reduces the total amount that is burdened by this to $14,724. 
So change order one will be for 14724 It will be adjusted so that within the next payment, bid item number four will be removed and change order for a total of 21350 will be added. So the net difference between the two of what the next payment will be will be $14,724. But your, ch your change order need, if you had... If you had bid item four in the original contract, mm -hmm. you have to take it back out. Yes. By way of change order. That's part of this, yes. Okay, so it's not just a pay movement, it's a change order and then a pay. Am I? I'm looking for agreement, Les, <laughs> or correction, as the case may be. I think, I think you're on the right track, and maybe where, what's throwing us off just a little bit is in the CCSR language that it says it's a $21,000 change order. Exactly. The net is a $14,000 change order because it's 21 addition, okay. 6000 reduction, yes. or about that. So, yeah, the net change order will be $14,000. That's good. Right. What happened to the grindings? The grindings, we have recovered a portion of them, and a portion that could not be reused by us has been hauled off so by the contractor. So we are reusing what we can. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The original proposed work was to grind the asphalt off. When they do that, were they grinding down into the base below it at, at the same time? Yes. And then all in one pass, it was being mixed and put back? Is that Was that the, the original, original plan? The original intent was to have it work that particular way. What happened on Adam Street is they ran into large portions of larger aggregate that it could not be mixed right, into. Right, right. process wouldn't work. Yeah, and also a concrete street underneath a portion of Adams <laughs> that we were unaware of. Okay. Oh, man. Yes, sir. Anything? No, I'm good. I, I mean, I'm good now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gary. Uh, item 5 uh, can be moved to council, please, and consent agenda. Yes, sir. Thank you, Thank you Scott. Okay, Les gets to come back up for a 409 South Jackson Street LLC development agreement. Better known as the EMSI project, street sidewalk project, I guess. Yes, the MSI site uh, sidewalk or frontage improvements, and this frontage is one that you've actually seen a couple of times okay. um, in going through the process. Uh, we brought to you some concepts about uh, some cost sharing on improvements in front of the MSI, and then it has expanded um, to uh, also look at some improvements in front of um, the building to the north. And so I'll take just a minute and kind of walk through that uh, just so folks are up to speed on what we're talking about. The area we're looking at is on Jackson Street, um, located between 6th on the south and 3rd on the north. Uh, this was the old Daily News building. That's how most people know it. It's now the new home of EMSI. And as part of that building remodeling and redevelopment for the new business, uh, there was a gym grant uh, applied for and received uh, through the city uh, to help deal with things like fiber installation to serve the building, plus frontage improvements along the fringe of that section of the street itself. And um, through... The, the fiber ran up the alley from 6th Street? I believe that is the case. I think it came up the alley and came to the back of the building. Okay. And that is in place. Uh, so the remaining portion is the frontage improvements um, along the west side of Jackson Street. And many discussions over the course of the last month or so, uh, working with the owner of the building, Mark Wentz, plus the tenant, which is EMSI, uh, we've been looking at how to make sure this project could move forward, uh, potentially city participation and funding. As part of that discussion, uh, we then kind of looked a little bit further afield, if you will, and said, well, would it make sense? And this was a discussion, I think, that happened right here. In, oh, in more than right here. It was this and gentleman right here. This, this gentleman right here. Full credit. That said, well, what if we were to look at also including the frontage uh, to the north in front of the Salvation Army? complex in the building. And so that's uh, what we've been pursuing since that time. Um, we have a new design uh, that was essentially in addition to the previous design done by Hodge and Associates 
for that frontage. It now includes the frontage of the Salvation Army up to their driveway. Uh, we have then also worked with um, Mr. Wentz and EMSI on how to package all of this, keeping in mind that those additional improvements uh, would be funded through the city's efforts rather than through uh, the developer. And um, carrying it forward. We've had to go through ITD, Idaho Transportation Department, for approval. Uh, they've given us verbal approvals on the concept. They're looking at the plans right now. Uh, we don't have a written formal approval yet, but we're anticipating that shortly. Um, we've, Gary has worked with the URA on the portion of uh, the funding uh, that is eligible for reimbursement under the Urban Renewal Agency agreement and the board uh, has looked at that and given the blessing to that. I believe it goes back to the board later this Final week. Approval. Final approval um, shortly uh, to get that uh, agreement together as well. So all that being said, uh, what is before you today is a development agreement that uh, I believe Gary worked up this last week. I was, I was away, uh, so this one came together uh, in my absence. Uh, but uh, it addresses... Um, essentially, the, the concept here that there would be improvements done along the frontage of EMSI with participation by EMSI and Mr. Wentz uh, and the city uh, to make the improvements that are outlined um, in the uh, drawings and in the package uh, that we've discussed previously. Uh, within that, uh, there's also a funding uh, breakdown of how all that would come together. Uh, this reflects that with a few minor round-offs on some of the dollars and cents. Uh, essentially, we're looking at uh, rem using the remainder of the Jim Grant funding, the 32000 uh, that's still there. Uh, we would use about 3300 of pavement management program funding. That's a normal overlay and uh, street maintenance type uh, program that we do. Uh, some out of the sidewalk program that represents that 30% of sidewalk costs for the downtown business district that we've been doing within that program. A street light program and that would be replacing um, some of the existing Cobra Head lights with new LED historic district type luminaires. Uh, some labor by our streets department representing roughly $4,400 for demolition of sidewalk and curb. Something we do in our sidewalk program as a matter of course. Uh, arts program participation in the tree grates, the artistic tree grates that would go into the new trees. Uh, and then some numbers here representing contribution by uh, Mr. Wentz and EMSI. And these two are the ones that would be subject to the agreement uh, with the URA on a 10-year reimbursement plan. All things being equal, they would be reimbursed to 42? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> So grand total roughly 110000 This does include uh, some contingency dollars uh, within that. Uh, and so it may be that we don't spend quite that much before we're done. But you know how Les, what was go. that bottom number the last time we saw this? Uh, it was it was 89, I think, before we added, or 86 or 89 before we added the piece to the north. Uh, I talk about the uh, stormwater detention, the catch basin that, provides us some opportunities for savings? Yeah, part of what happened here is the, the original concept uh, was such that it, it created a location where the water that would be running, stormwater running down the curb line, would, would pond because there was nowhere for it to go due to the, the bull bout, if you will, going uphill. Uh, up water running the south down the west Down curb the curb line, line right, uh, because the curb line would then shift out towards, the, towards Jackson Street Center and it's running uphill, if you will, so you create a ponding situation. To avoid that, there was some storm work that had to be included, catch basin, some new storm line to get around that area. By extending uh, the work to the north, we actually go up to an existing catch basin that's there near the driveway, um, and so therefore we don't have that's to do that storm idea. work. So there is some reduction in cost with that, which offsets the increase. Increase in cost on the, and the additional work to the north. If that makes sense. So, Gary, is this a twenty thousand dollar increase over what we had previously looked at? Yeah, roughly. Again, is is uh, that not more than what we had? No, I think that wasn't that, that what we saw that last what we week. Saw? That's what we were talking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's last week, maybe even a thousand less than we were talking okay, last. Okay, because I don't, I don't have the previous. And there are some things that need to happen yet. As less indicated, ITD still needs to put their. Um, approval on this. Uh, Mr. Wentz, once everything's in place, will need to 
uh, discuss with his contractor, McCall's Classic Construction, uh, in order to get it done this fall. And the reimbursement request through the URA needs to happen as well. So uh, a lot of moving parts, but we're really trying to get this done this fall if we possibly can. And um, as Les indicated, there's significant savings that we can have if we, if the idea is to move it north anyway, you'd just be jerking that catch basin out and, and moving it up anyway. Well, so. we can, yeah, we can use, use the existing system rather than have to add yeah. new. So the, the previous number was about 98, 99,000 with the, the original mm -hmm. concept. Right and so we, you know, we're adding roughly 10 to 11, 12,000 overall. Yeah, that's closer to what I thought change. we were yeah. doing. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's an addition of about 24 or so with the, the added pavement and all that, but then the reduction on the stormwater side is a net change of 11, 12,000. So, and just to be clear, if no matter what, these improvements would they they would be on the city's dime if we didn't have this participation going on. Yeah, so there is there are no public elect to do it. If we were elected. Like yeah, there are no public improvements associated with the MSI um, remodel. So this is a desire of the developer to improve the street frontage and of course if we can take advantage of that and that's what the URA is there for as well so it really is those three entities working together so I answer your question is yes it would be totally on the city's uh, expense um, Les I'm looking at the spreadsheet and I just now saw this how many luminaires are there in the new project? I believe the total is three. Um, I think there's four. If I'm looking at the, the, if I'm looking at what I think I'm looking yeah, at. Yeah, excuse me, there are four. Yeah. There are four total. And it appears that you've got three on the spreadsheet. If you look in uh, the second grouping of, of so you're, columns, you're, you'll see a city. The second column is the. Okay, so it gets a total of four. There's the fourth one, right. Good. Three in the original, and then we added one with the, the addition. Okay. The extension. So the city quantity, the second one, is that's not the changes. That is the change. That's the plus and minus change. That's correct. Okay. So if you look in there, for okay. instance, under the stormwater, you'll see a minus, num minus value, uh -huh. negative value. That, that's the reduction of those storm okay. items that would not have to be built. And then okay. the additional trees, the additional luminaries, et cetera. Yes, sir. I'm all for it. Yes. Somebody, somebody bright come up with that one, didn't they? <laughs> Brilliant. That's Brilliant idea. idea. Do you want a plaque on the sidewalk? Oh, right maybe. <laughs> maybe later. Brilliant. We had another luminator out there. Brilliant. <laughs> um, can it go consent? Or it can. You? Okay. Thank you. And we will do that. Thank you, Les. Okay, that concludes the itemized or the listed items on the agenda. We now have some reports. Oh, one question, one comment regarding the previous item. Has Jim Grant, Boise, been advised what we're doing? Yes, uh, Elise has been in contact with them, and it's a go. Okay. All right. Mr. Palmer, we'd like to open the FY 2014 budget for reasons... Yet to be he dismissed. will explain to us. We took in a lot more money than we expected, and we got to raise the budget, right? Actually, no. Um, <laughs> Darn. Uh, normally, we open the budget for those exact reasons, but in this particular time, um, we had a council decision back in April uh, to um, increase the amount of funding from the Hamilton Fund for the Joseph Street Playfields. This is the only uh, recommendation. Due to, due to the high uh, bid price that we got. Correct, to the tune of 369000 Now, there's a substantial likelihood that this, because they're going to, uh, the contract says that we're going to roll this into November, that the 1.5 might be sufficient. But because of flexibility, I'm recommending just to roll the entire amount into the open budget process. So of 1.869 million. So that's my recommendation. Um, so you know, rather than trying to guess where the percentage of completion might be, 
uh, through November, my recommendation is to roll the whole thing. The, in the 2015 budget, we have some of those same funds in the budget uh, at $750,000, if you recall. So I don't know where the construction season is going to end or, you know, things that crop up uh, and delay the project. So that's the maximum amount of flexibility we could provide. So this is the only item you have? This is the only item I have. The current budget for our participation in the cost of construction of the play fields is currently the much? the amount in, in of 2014 oh in the 2014 budget is 1.5 million okay and you're proposing that that be raised to 1. Point 1 1 million 869,517 dollars it will require a public hearing on monday so that's why it's a Tuesday. report or Tuesday, excuse me. Thank you. And there will be an ordinance involved, and that's in the packet as well. And if and if the work, well, the work won't be completed by the end of sep by September 30. We know that. Correct. Do you have any money in the budget for 2015, or how do we get that money moved across the the? We in anticipation and the resolution that we did, uh, or the memo that I did, uh, amending the budget uh, packet from the pub, uh, workshop into what was the date? August 4th workshop. I had included the $750,000 into the 2015 budget, so it is covered at very adequately. So okay. with. With this, we will have budgeted two million five in fourteen and fifteen combined. No, we are budgeting seven hundred fifty thousand. We're not going to spend it. I understand that, but you've got appropriation for it for two million five. Well, you're not going to expend it in two thousand and fourteen. But we're fixing the budget for it, as if we might, because he doesn't know when exactly. the bills will come. So what doesn't get budgeted will carry over into, we budgeted to carry over into next year. That's correct. Okay. okay. And are we going to have to, at the end of 15, reopen to say, this is how much we carried in, or... or you know, if we decide, you know, if we don't spend it all and we decide to if put it we, back into the let, Hamilton Fund. I'll give you a scenar couple scenarios. One is we could spend the 1.5. Mm -hmm. And we need three hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars in twenty fifteen. Of the seven hundred and fifty, three sixty nine gets spent and then the other four hundred stays uh, it stays just stays there as uh, uh, unbudgeted or okay. unappropriated well appropriated but not expended funds. Okay. So what happens to those? Just stay in the fund. Just stay in the fund. Stay in the Hamilton fund. It's only for that specific purpose. So those funds can't be captured and put somewhere else. No, okay. no, not at all. It's a special, uh, well, special purpose fund. That particular fund. So, questions? Nope. You you had trouble understanding the debit and credit on the street yes. project, and this you've totally got. Come on, Mark. the man is clear as well water. <laughs> okay, you're good. I'm good. Okay. Thanks, Don. Thank Council you. agenda. Public hearing? Well, actually, it doesn't even do that. It's just a report, isn't it? Okay. Yep. Well, no, he wants it on the Monday agenda, right? It's already on. It's already on. It's so a public hearing. All he's doing is giving you an update. Yep. Okay. Tim Davis is going to talk to us about single stream recycling. And I would <laughs> don't want to <laughs> don't want to. <laughs> okay. I don't want to do anything to tell you how to do your presentation except tell you. Assume nobody knows what it is when you start, <laughs> would you? Yeah. Do you want me to set it? It's already on. Okay. Well, I'm not even sure I know how to I haven't used that one. Where's Bill? He knows. Yeah, where, where's, where's Bill Knapp when you need him? <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Stay ready, Bill. This is an engineer. There we go. There we go. All right. What is single stream recycling? I will talk a bit about it. I first wanted to thank council for giving me a full year to uh, put my time toward the new roll cart program, which I needed to do, and I appreciate that very much. Told you I would Bottom come. To death. 
come forward with uh, some information on single stream. Um, source separated, which is currently what we use in Moscow, of course, requires sorting of recycling material into separate containers and placed at the curb for collection. Some folks use up to three or four different containers. It's then sorted by the collection folks into a uh, truck that has a number of different uh, um, collection compartments within it. Um, we're pretty much limited at the, the, the quantities and types of materials that we can accept at the curb because of the limited compartments on that truck. The difference between source separated and single stream is single stream requires no sorting. Uh, we generally use a roll cart. By the producer of the recycled material. Correct. All the material goes into a roll cart. It's stored, um, wheeled to the curb on collection day. It's collected by a single compartment truck. Um, potentially it could be done with an automated truck like we're using with the roll cart. So it could, could just be a one-man operation ultimately. Once uh, the single stream material is collected, it's typically bailed and shipped to a material recovery facility, facility um, short term for it is a MRF. Um, City of Moscow residential curbside currently uses a source separated method. Um, curbside recycling program here in Moscow was initiated in 1998 and implemented in April of 99. Uh, curbside collection is done by Latos Sanitation Moscow Recycling through our franchise agreement. Um, LSI Moscow Recycling retains the revenues from the sales of the recycled material that is collected. Uh, Moscow Recycling Center processes an average of 3,734 tons of recycling material annually, of which 14% or 524 tons is uh, collected at residential curbside. So. The difference is at the recycle center? So they're getting 3,200 tons down to the recycle center. Some of that is accounted for. They have a commercial collection of cardboard, which oh, okay, is, okay. It was just a big part of it, too. Okay. But ultimately, about 40% of all of our recyclables are dropped off at the recycling center. 14% is picked up at the curb. So that's, that was kind of surprising. Yeah, I thought okay. it would be more. B before you leave that, go to uh, a, a Regarding bullet three, whether you count from the top or the bottom, um, LSI Moscow Recycling retains the revenue from the sales of recycling materials. Correct. And the city pays LSI for collection Correct. of the curbside Correct. materials. Correct. Okay. And again, we'll talk about some statistics here that I was kind of surprised by. Um, Moscow curbside recycling participation rate is only about 25% um, based on a seven-week survey, survey that was conducted by Latos Sanitation Moscow Recycling this summer. They were averaging about 1,400 set-outs per week of about 5,410 residential accounts that have access to curbside recycling. Um, these, in, these numbers indicate that the recycling center is used more heavily than curbside services and it basically told me that residential curbside recycling particip participation has a lot of room to grow. Um, curbside recycling is not currently available to apartment units in Moscow. And I ran some numbers and found out that we had 465 apartment complexes with a total of 3,998 total units. So apartment complexes offer a potential for single stream curbside recycling services, which would likely increase tonnage considerably. Yes. I've got one uh, about your 25 percent. Uh, it says 1,400 on a weekday, but I know in my case I don't generate enough stuff to put a bin out every week, and so I'm kind of hitting it every other week. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that some kind folks of are gone in the summer the too. I just wanted to get an idea. A bit, so it, the participation rate might be higher. It's just on a weekly basis. This makes it look lower than it actually is. So caution there about well, the... this was a seven-week survey. So yeah, he but he's saying... on the days you put it out. 
Hey, oh, well, in, in that his, case, I feel all count. good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Every other time. But, yeah, at every other week, though, because he's showing 1,400 people per week using it. Well, if you're 1,400 this week and then you get 1,400 the other week, you are actually got 2,800 households all together who participate, well, or you just might, not on a weekly it basis. It might be 2,000. Yeah. But. In a seven-week survey isn't real scientific, but it gives us kind of an idea what yeah, we have out we're there. We're still spitballing. <clears throat> yeah. Sounds low. Yeah. It does, but... And another reason, you know, the, the apartment complexes, there there are a lot of them throughout the city. And the part of the reason I suspect that it hasn't been offered there is we'd have four million of these little containers around there. And they're really kind of, a lot of them are, you know, they, they don't have the space. Where if you've got some large roll carts in there, they've been doing this in Pullman for a number of years. It, it works. It works. Well, I think well. there are a few businesses, and Andy will shake his head or nod it, but, but he does do this with that mm -hmm. they do some single stream stuff. So. Yep. Yep. Smaller apartment units, fourplexes, and smaller that don't have dumpster service can participate in curbside. Once you repeat that, so we caught that. Um, why don't you come up? <laughs> Andy, introduce your name, rank, and serial number. All right, please. Andy Boyd, rank colonel, serial number 03. <laughs> no, uh, I am the operations manager for Moscow Recycling and Lataw Sanitation. Thank Andy you. Boyd. Um, just, uh, we are collecting some apartments, you know, initially, Tim is correct, we couldn't have, you know, 4,200 bins sitting out at each apartment complex, so basically when the system was put together, they set it up so that four plexes or smaller that are on the garbage can service are able to use the curbside program, but the larger units are with dumpster. So they have the green bins at, right. the, at the four plexes? Correct, the, if they choose to. The, the duplexes, triplexes, and four plexes could have them and have and use the green bins if they have garbage can service anything larger than a four don't get green bins generally not no so I wanted to talk about some of the pros and cons that that I've observed in looking at different systems around uh, the obvious pro is convenience um, there's less time sorting there's uh, you know they don't have to think about it it all goes in one bin um, single roll cart container, it requires less space and probably a smaller footprint at the curb, I would suspect, than somebody using two or three of the smaller containers unless they're stacking them. Um, it gives us an opportunity to collect a wider variety of recycling materials at the curb because we're not constrained by compartments and that type of thing. Um, it's easier and faster to collect the materials placed at the curb because it can be collected with a semi-automated or a fully automated collection truck like we're currently doing with the roll carts for the garbage end of it. Um, the curbside recycling could be offered to apartment units. Um, and then the communities that have single stream recycling love the convenience. Everybody I spoke to that has this type of system, their, their customers love it. Um, and many of the single stream recycling programs that I've looked at realize an increase in not only participation but tonnage due to that convenience. The cons are the costs. Um, we have increased processing costs with single stream. Typically what happens is this material is sent to a MRF and they charge a processing cost and I'll get into that a little more as we move along which directly affects the revenue. Now right now we sort at the truck and it's sent off sorted it's to some end user separately. who isn't having to separate. Correct. Okay. Correct. So you're adding another level of handling. Correct. And then the quality, um, typically you see con contamination generally increases. Um, glass can cause a number of problems. We've talked about that a little bit, both in separation and contamination issues, and it also lowers the marketability and the revenue further. Um, disposal costs for contamination can also increase the processing costs further. Um, and quality is directly related to marketability of any recyclable material, whether it's single stream or uh, source separated. 
And I put a little note there on the bottom, the economy and the markets. And during the economic downturn back in 2008, there was a number of municipalities in this area that were paying 40 to $60 per ton, up and above that processing cost, just to have a processor accept that type of material. So the markets do play a role in this, but typically when you see the markets go south, all the markets are south, but when they're blended like this and you're paying that processing cost, you, you, you are a little vulnerable. So what do they pay when it's not an economic downturn of 2008? It varies. You know, the markets change from month to month. And I'll, I'll show you a slide of an example of how uh, Republic Services deals with Pullman's single stream, and it'll kind of give you a breakdown. Just while we're right here, what are we paying for just transporting to the waste site of regular garbage per ton? Right now, I believe it is in the, to the waste site. We pay forty-seven dollars, if I remember correctly. It's f mid forties. I believe it's forty-seven oh four a ton. So these processing costs that I've been talking about will likely be in the $75 per ton range. Um, and like I talked about earlier, these costs will affect the revenue that the franchisee currently receives for the commodity sales. There will be some additional cart costs, and then there will be some costs for advertising and promotional costs. Um, if recycling commodity prices is prices fall below the cost of processing, who accepts that burden? And I did find one model in Kootenai County where they were able to contract with a processor that accepted a zero floor price. And what this means is that in the event that the recycling commodity prices fall below that of the processing price, they would accept that material for a zero floor price, meaning that Kootenai County would get a zero net income and they would still have to get rid of that material. So in their in Kootenai County's case, there, and it, I'll just plop that on here with that. Moscow Recycling would collect from the from everybody. We would pay X dollars for that collection. That the city would, if it dropped below, and that X dollars didn't cover it. Somebody has to burden. They're that. they're they're eating that until. The market comes back up, so so they could store it on site until the market got better too. I mean, if if, if that's they what they had chose the to space do. to do it, yes. I don't know if Kootenai County has the space, but I know we don't at the moment. <laughs> I suspect Kootenai County doesn't either. And then I just wanted to talk about a few of the regional programs that I looked at. Um, and they vary. The revenues and the contracts are a little bit different with each community. Pullman Disposal is a private company, and they're regulated by the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission. Um, they bill directly for garbage and single stream, and single stream is included in that garbage rate. They retain 100% of the net revenues from the sales of that recyclable material that is collected. City of Spokane, their contract... So the, so the city of Pullman has no cost for solid waste or or recycle the, the residents do but the city does not other than their own i would other suspect than paying yeah, for their own Pullman Pullman disposal bills their residents right. directly and they're yeah. regulated by the, and then the public yep, utilities right. commission okay okay so rather than yeah, I, i'll get it then the city of Spokane, of course, is a municipality. Um, they collect materials um, similar. They bill for single stream, which is included in the garbage collection rates. They retain 75% retain of the net revenues from the sales of their materials, and 25% of that net stays with their processor. Um, and just a side note, the month of April, the city of Spokane received $98,000, just over $98,000 in revenues, but paid their processor $105,000 for a net loss of $7,200 for the month of April. Spokane's a little different animal. They're paying over $100 a ton for the waste energy plant up there, and I think they can absorb those losses when the markets aren't 
aren't up where they need to be. So that's the difference there. Um, City of Lewiston has a franchise agreement with Sunshine Disposal um, for garbage and single stream recycling collection. City of Lewiston bills for those services. Sunshine Disposal performs collection of single stream recycling and retains 100% of the net revenues from the recycling material. Tim, when you say that they bill, when they bill for single stream included in garbage collection rate, there's not another line on the utility bill for single stream. No. Every everyone that has solid waste collection gets a bill for that, and they get given a. I think these cities all use the roll carts. Correct. They get given a solid waste roll cart of their size choosing mm -hmm. and they get given a single stream cart of whatever size the system calls for yes whether the city's dictating it or they're requesting a particular size yes and I think in Lewiston they also include the uh, yard waste collection in that garbage section of the bill as well as people being able to drop off at Clearwater composting their yard waste okay. which we in our garbage bill pay for Recycling collection and the your curbside of recycling collection is included as part of your garbage collection rates now, right. and all three of these. Um, the Lewiston one's pretty similar to yes. ours. Right? Yes. Other than we don't know about the recycling. This was a sample I was um, speaking of. Um, this is a breakdown of Pullman's material that's sent to Seattle to Republic Services uh, MRF over there. And this is the March market prices for each commodity. You've got cardboard, newsprint, mixed paper, and on down the line. And what they do in the sampling is they break open three to four bales, each container load that's sent down there, and they break it apart, and they, they come up with a characterization, and they determine the whole load is that same character. So you've got 14% of the OCC which equates to 21.95 and then on down. So at the end of the day, that total load was worth $119.14 per ton, less the processing costs, and then you get a net revenue of that, 45.75. And that's kind of how it works. Questions on that? So, and I don't, I don't know how close you are to then, but I can see an increase in tonnage of, well, in, increase in participation is going to increase the tonnage. And is that going to, if not, if not just be a wash as far as what may be, um, wh well, obviously you're, even though they're dinging you for the glass and the residue, they're still making some, some money off of it. So Some months they are, some months they aren't. This is just a one-month example. Right. Um, for instance, I just got a, a price list from Republic today in an email, and I think cardboard was down to 110. Is that right? So there's that. There's that too. The market right. fluctuates. The markets really fluctuate every month. In 2008, so, when we had the, the you know the decline, you know cardboard went from about 150 to 32 dollars a ton. Wow. You know, so that. But you also, know. if you can get more participation from the large apartment complexes and things like that, the amount of Tonnage of trash you're sending to the landfill <coughs> is going to decrease. Yeah, that's the other well. thing that I'm right. looking you're at. You're saving as far it as on the, the other right. end. It's it's. Now, Tim, if you're up there on your chart, if they did not take glass, which you've said contaminates the bundles, they wouldn't have that. They'd save loss, dollars. but their processing fee would be be less. Processing fee remains the same. Why? Okay, if. Still looking at residue from the other container. Well, the residue's still there, but the residue's there. The glass is still there. They get a negative charge for their glass just for handling that. And it, again, what I'll I, say is, it's not the glass; it's the broken glass. And there's no way to bail that material without breaking. I understand it. that, but so if you didn't have the glass in there, is what I'm asking. Your net would be 122 something a ton, and your processing fee would be the same. Processing fee okay. stays so the same. Okay, so they're collecting it in the negative number. Of, exactly. Okay, I, I got it. Exactly. Cool. Another accounting lesson today. Yes, there you go. <laughs>
Okay. And then quality control, that was one of the, the cons that I spoke of. But um, material quality and contamination levels are directly related to the following factors. The level of promotion and education that is given the program, whether you have a volume-based garbage collect collection system in place, which we do, um, whether glass is included or excluded from the curbside program, the quantity of different materials that are accepted, and whether collectors can visually inspect the material before it's dumped into the collection vehicle. When with an automated rig, that's going to be a little more difficult. It will be. Actually, not necessarily. We're looking to potentially change over to uh, this Corrado can system, which allows us to see what's going in before it goes into the truck. Mm. And they've so tested that extent. a little bit on the roll cart system, and essentially what it is is it looks kind of like a dumpster that's packed on the forks of the front loader, and then it's got a little arm off to the side that just dumps these roll carts, and the driver's looking right so down in there. So he's doing it in front of himself instead of behind. Instead of well, above him. I, I saw something the other day, and this is just a quick question and looking for a quick answer. I happen to be walking up the street behind a roll cart emptying truck and noticed at one particular house when he put that cart up, he stopped and then he shook it before he put it back down. And I was wondering if he had a camera or a mirror or something where he could see that it didn't come out and I need to get it out of there. Or was that just his he, hand slipped and he hit the trigger several times? We do times. have a camera. There is a camera. You can't totally see inside the whole dumpster, but you can see, like, sometimes if a bag, occasionally a bag will get hung up that in that bar on the inside, and he'd be able to see that hanging, so he shakes it a little bit okay, to get so it Okay, so that would explain why, possibly why he shook it was he realized he hadn't gotten it empty. That, or in the past, we've had to go back there because they stuffed the stuff real hard, so you kind of remember those go-backs, and you might just say, well, I don't want to come back here again, and then... <laughs> You kind of learn your problem stops, you know, so to 12 speak. 1202 Cherry Street really packs it tight, huh? <laughs> and part of the problem early on was that was such a new vehicle that they couldn't adjust any of the settings to do that in the very beginning to where now that it's been out there and loosened up a little bit, I think they're able to adjust some of those things. And then I just... I put down some discussion points, and I also sent these questions to Andy because I wanted to get his take on it. But um, can the single stream process be conducted at the current recycling center, or should it be pursued at another less urbanized location? And how would a single stream system affect expansion plans at the current recycling center? Viability of the current drop-off recycling system at the recycling center, and would that go away? And then the impact to LSI, and will local jobs be lost? And I can let Andy speak to um, his answers. And <laughs> You're going to let him read the ones he sent you? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the biggest impact on LSI would be improved efficiency in collection. Uh, right now, we currently require two employees, two people on that truck to get it done. Sometimes it still takes them eight or nine hours a day, even though our stops aren't that huge. And, you know, and that just has to do with the fact that every stop, you got to run back and forth on the truck, putting the stuff in the appropriate compartments. Um, you know, with the automated system, if we went to a side load or a Corrado can type of system, you know, we would be down to one employee, and obviously we can collect it significantly faster per stop. Um, <coughs> you know, the other impacts would be just uh, capital costs such as the totes, a uh, new truck, things of that nature. Um, we, you know, as far as any jobs potentially being lost, um, we perceive maybe one job would be lost because that one individual wouldn't have to be in that truck. However, we, you know, with until we go that route, we may be able to reassign that person into something else. So I don't want to say for sure, but it is possible one job might be lost. Um, what do you use personnel-wise at the recycle center to empty that truck? It goes to the recycle center? Right. How do you empty that truck? By hand, or is it automated, or what? It basically, each compartment gets emptied out. So we, you know, the truck will back in, you know, for all the paper gets backed in and dumped on the floor in the appropriate spot in the recycling center. In between each dump, you got to come out and weigh it. Um, the glass, the tin, and aluminum go into a bin. 
that you can just put behind the truck. It dumps into that, and then that goes into the appropriate the spot as well. The truck can dump the individual compartment. Right, each door opens up as you're going along. Oh, okay. So that's how that works. So there's not as much labor getting it out as there was getting it in. Right. Although, again, with this, tr you know, single stream, it's just back in once, dump it, and you're gone. Okay. So, I mean, that would, you know, make that process a bit quicker as well. Uh, let's see. Can this process be conducted on the current recycling center site, uh, or should it be pursued at another less urbanized location? We can do this at the site we're currently at. Our biggest issue down there is is storage, you know, and Jim and I have been talking about that. Um, you know, moving it to a, a less urbanized area, I think, in general, would be a good thing. I don't know if it's necessary, but, I, you know, just we still get noise complaints because being that it's open 24-7, you know, still have people dropping off glass at 3 in the morning, and so sometimes people in the surrounding areas do hear that, and they'll call us and say, hey, is there anything you can do about that? So, you know, from that standpoint, yeah, but, I mean, you know, the other question would be is if somewhere down the line... You're not going to empty this truck at 3 in the morning. No, 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 no. No, absolutely <laughs> not. Um, you know, the other question would be is if at some point we decided we wanted to try and sort the single stream ourselves, um, you know, we don't really have the economy of scale to make that extremely lucrative, but there are some cheaper ways of doing that where we, you know, maybe we don't separate everything, but a few of the commodities we can separate out so we can maintain more control over quality and things of that nature and gain more revenue back out of that material. Do you have to have a bailing machine you don't have now? No. You have a bailing machine yep. now? Oh, okay. And it would take the volume? Yeah. Not, that wouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, viability of the drop-off recycling program. I wouldn't see that going away since already 40% of our materials coming in that way. If we stop accepting glass, you know, that's another reason why people may still want to come down to do that. And Tim and I had actually talked about if we were to stop glass, you know, maybe putting a few more drop locations around town for it to make it as convenient Thanks. as possible. Stop taking glass at the curbside. Curb at the curbside, right. yes. Sorry. Thank you for the clarification. So Just trying to keep up. All right. No, you're doing a great job. Uh, so that's my initial answers to those questions, and be happy to answer any more. You don't any see more. any showstoppers, do you? You know, the only showstopper is marketability of your material, making sure that it's as clean as possible. You know, when we, in 2008, when we had the downturn, the economic downturn, because all of our stuff is source separated, and we usually work with local markets, we had no problem getting rid of any of our material, which was not the case with a lot of other places. With the single streams, though. Yeah, because single streams harder to get rid of. A lot of it gets shipped overseas, and when that happened, China stopped taking a whole bunch of stuff. And so because we didn't ship overseas, our materials were able to move. Uh, the mills where we send our materials are familiar with what we produce and the quality of it. So those are things that we need to keep into consideration. Quality is, is key. You said something earlier about taking things you cannot take now because your truck doesn't have enough compartments. Does that mean my coffee plastic can that I forget every time I finally go through one not to put it in recycle can go in recycle? Well, it could go on the curbside. I mean, currently you could yeah, take the that. Right, right, but, yeah. but it, won't be, it won't be left in my green bucket anymore. Right. Okay. Just checking. <laughs> And a few other plastics as well. Okay. Plastics is where you gain the largest increase in what you can take, depending on where you send it. Certain places take more. Because cardboard is cardboard. You take that. Paper's paper. Paper's paper. Yeah, we probably have to stop taking shredded paper at the curb. Hmm. You know, because currently they just throw that in a plastic sack, and then we empty that out at the center when it gets dropped off. But generally in a in a commingled system they don't like the shredded paper because how do you shred it it's sorted it just kind of yeah okay questions no Stay so on. when do we start um i guess if uh if you'd like to can you know keep pursuing this i'll keep going on it obviously we won't know what our costs will be until we put together a formal proposal to LSI and work through a few things but um, yeah and I don't know if it I guess Gary how close are we on to the getting a city survey out we will put it out this fall it's within a month because maybe that's months. a question to ask in it is would you, 
do you currently use curbside recycling and would you if we did this I would yeah. check past surveys as well because I think we've asked that question if we've, been, if we've asked it before uh, yeah I think that this not that it's bad to an, you know ask it again but it gives you you'll be, be able to track it right. and it may be one of those ones that's always on pleasure. There. no you're looking no, concerned I need to just look and see what's been asked in the past right would it is it is it a good question to ask without providing an explanation of what it means well that's part of the problem is how much information do you give I mean I don't think there's any doubt I mean even judging by the council the more convenient the recycling the better people like it uh, you've heard some of the downsides today they aren't they aren't showstoppers but yeah. they're definitely things that you need to be concerned about and there will be a cost associated with right. it I don't but think you're going to see a lot of people who would be against curbside or excuse me against oh, single stream recycling but they'll want to see the bottom line so I think Tim's comment about if you want to proceed with this which is obvious that you do we will continue to to evolve and and get some better estimates for you okay. and then you can decide just so we did with roll cards and well, also with the larger yeah. look at things about that which is going into the single stream recycling ain't making it into the regular trash right. stream and using that information as well so not just the cost associated with the single stream but also the offset what are, what's the savings yeah. there and and that's one of the things that we've talked about in the past too the more that you people pay for to get rid of garbage right and if you recycle typically you don't pay to get r rid of recycling the, the collection yes but there is a net effect to the solid waste program and that needs to be estimated and okay um, we we need to let the engineering guys come up and give us a quick tour of what, Thank you. what they've Thanks. built Welcome. this year. Yes. Um, Gary, let's do this on this topic. Move it forward. We're in staff. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, unless you've got some reason to say we don't want to do that or we can't do that, let's move it forward to a, to a proposal. Okay. We'll continue we'll, to, to work. To a package on proposal on the, on. Okay. And I would, I would personally say one that, does not include glass. Yeah, see, uh, you know, how much difference that would make. And I've kind of thought through the concept in my head. I visited with Andy a little bit. We both have enough years out there. I think that we can come back with some sort of plan and choices and show you how uh, a system might look and be designed and, and if that's something that and looks... what it would cost the exactly. taxpayers rate-wise. Exactly. Thank you both. Thank yes. you, Andy. Thanks. Mr. Bontrager, have y'all built anything this summer that you didn't find concrete under? <laughs> a few things. <laughs> Some things we added concrete on top of. <laughs> <coughs> so we'll just take this as a, the abbreviated process and just kind of show some pictures of what we had accomplished this year. So one of the first projects we started with was the Hatley Way sidewalk improvements, which out there we basically ran a new stretch of sidewalk from the mall frontage down towards U-Haul to make a connection between the mall. This is looking south this is looking from south the gravel driveway from, from toward the, the sewer plant across yes. the highway. Yes. So this is a before picture. This would be an after picture of that portion of the connection. This would be looking northeast towards the mall before. And there's the new sidewalk that runs in ADA compliance, making the connection up essentially to the mall frontage. Kevin, did we ever get our bush at the end of the sidewalk? I don't think so. Can we? Do you have one we can put there? <laughs> uh, probably. <coughs> do, I need, do I need to buy it? <laughs> would be helpful. Kevin and I had a discussion about the continuation of the previous sidewalk down to nowhere and yeah. I was lobbying for a barrier which didn't win the argument but I heard comments that well there could be a bush down at the end to show that you can't go that way I was just wondering if we got a bush that's all no not yet okay so the next one up was the 2013 pedestrian curb ramp improvement project this was the first one where we got a grant applied through the state to basically fix pedestrian ramps on the state infrastructure. So I have just a couple example pictures from what we had. This was the before. This is on uh, Washington and First. 
before and after. So we fixed, you know, the ADA compliance with these. I think y'all are doing a great job with these. I just yeah. hope this doesn't become the before picture in 10 years and you're showing us what you did to change it. Yeah. Some of them aren't even that old. Yeah, yeah, some of them aren't even that old. <laughs> Here's another one on Main and C Street. Just the difference of how code compliance has changed. Mm-hmm. And here's the the 2014. You know, we essentially did these both the same summer, even though we applied for the grants in two different periods. So here's down on Main and Sweet. This is right off of the bike path, um, the northeast corner there, just by Domino's. Before and after, making that connection, we actually widened uh, the portion that came from the bike path and widened it on the other side too. Really cleans it up. Yeah. Here's another one on the southeast corner of Main and Steiner. Before they were single drops like this that were non-compliant for wheelchairs rolling up and they did not have a appropriate size landing at the top. Whereas now with the, the different style, they are more directional for the direction that people need to go and also have appropriate sized landings where they can roll up onto. Next one, the one we just basically discussed, was this year's pavement preservation project, the Grind Mix Pave. This is Adams and Adams and F. Adams F, and this is the Line Street portion Line of it. Okay. So this is line between the highway and A Streets up at the top up there. So that's before. I have to say it. You really think that needed some work? Huh. Yeah, just a little. Yeah. <laughs> Funny thing is, this one we only ground off two inches, and below that two inches, it was fine. So this is a two-inch inlay from what we ground off, and that's the difference. Yeah. And it's got a, uh, a paving fabric in between to help keep it uh, keep the water out from seeping into the subgrade. This was before on F Street Hill there uh, as you get to Hayes. And this is the after while they're still out there moving the paver. And this would be on Adams Street. This is uh, adjacent to the 1912 Center on Adams. And then I've got an after picture further up. This is the intersection of A and Adams. But in general, what it looks like, you know, brand new thermal plastic, brand new roadway section through the whole area. And uh, Adams was a lot like cutting hair, wasn't it? You didn't know where to stop. Yes. Everything you did showed you something else. Yes. And also didn't help, too, with, you know, the additional work of adding the water line and other things, you know, tore up more payments. So we extended the limits to cover what had been done for those, too. But yeah, once you got into it, it's difficult to know when to stop. This one still is in progress, is the North Polk Water Loop Connection. This is adding a water loop out there near the intersection of Public and Polk, extending further up to where it makes a connection back into where the water line ends south of Rodeo. So this is kind of start of the job where they're out there digging the trench and everything. Where, where, where are we? This right here is a picture, pretty public. much, yeah, public, okay. looking north. Right by the station. Looking shot. north, okay. Mm -hmm. This was prior to the intersection having to be closed. The intersection was closed for about a one to two week period. I think it was two weeks, three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was additional work that had to be done out there that wasn't necessarily anticipated with the amount of utilities that had to be crossed in that intersection. But this is kind of what the guys were out there dealing with on a daily basis. A lot of the times the, the trench was actually, had a large amount of water seeping into it too just because of the water level there. And this is the after, after things were paved back and everything out there. Uh, I should know this, contractor or city crews? That was Germer Construction was the contractor. Moscow Sidewalk Replacement Project. This is our yearly sidewalk replacement projects that we have for both commercial and residential uses to increase efficiency and, and reduce costs for anybody who wants to join the sidewalk program. Here's an example over here at uh, in front of Martin Auto. This is the before, well, during construction. And here's the after. And this was us. That was us who did the tear out. Okay. And then the pour back was done by Knox. Knox Concrete is our this year's sidewalk program okay. contractor. It was uh, paid for by the owner. We we were contributed thirty percent. Just paid. So, yeah. This one was on us. This is the police department. It was, you know, again another really broken up, vaulted everything through the sidewalk. Through you didn't the find side. any additional wells under that, did you? 
No. Like you did on the other side of the building? No, not on this not on this portion of it. Under water well on the other, on the wow. other side. Water rates. Well, it's they're using it to monitor it. And this is an after picture through that section. It's, a, it's in a, a cap. They did a really good job too of of keeping everything from breaking off on the stucco or anything like that. And on the, on the uh, last, could I, could I ask you a sidewalk question while they just did a sidewalk thing, please? I, I noticed around town that apparently when you may have had an intern uh, do some review of the status of sidewalks in town, they also marked some that someday somehow need to be repaired or replaced it looks like is there any thought to approach those property owners and tell them the city's program for doing private sidewalks i mean there's a couple on white avenue one of which is a great bicycle jump if i was still an eight-year-old and had a bike um, because it's kicked up it's marked somebody's marked it with white paint um, there are some others that you know they look like someday markings, or is that part of the program? Maybe Kevin knows. Yeah, that was a defect that we found that we sent a letter to the property owner asking them to repair it, and that was marked for removal. So, so by being marked, y'all have contacted them? Yes. Okay. Yes. And explain the fact that we do help and we provide our pricing. Absolutely. And all Absolutely. You, great job, Les. <laughs> 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 Don't be a millionaire. If you <laughs> and here's some pictures of the project that Tom Grennan had presented earlier. This is where we're going to be coming in and tearing out this portion of the Hamilton Low Aquatic Center's parking lot there, just directly north of the, the swim center there. So that is the largely alligator section through there that has more than likely been seeing subgrade failure from saturated subgrade. Is, is that a storm drain I'm looking at? That is a storm drain of which we'll be tying in the new underdrain pipes to so the storm put drains. Under drains under this on mm -hmm. the premise that, that it's that it's going to help drain the subgrade water that's eating up your pavement. Yeah, and we've been out there actually post rain storms and actually seen the amount of water seeping into the drainage structures through the subgrade. So yeah, the ground is wet there. And this would be the portion where you guys were discussing that four foot wide section. There's actually a lot of three to four inch wide cracks out there that to get in a paver, you need to widen it out to about four feet to get a, a half paver down there to actually so do it right. So this is not a three foot wide failure strip. No. It's a lengthwise crack yes. that you're having trouble getting enough tar in. Yes, exactly. And the, the amount of infiltration we get from water seeping through that. Okay. That's, that's the end of what we got. We've had some other small projects here and there, but it's the majority of the construction projects we had. You had, I think you were the one that asked for this, Art. Any questions for them, or does this nope. answer your question? Oh, it does. Okay. All right. Anything else? I think we're good. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Thank Thanks. you, Gary. We're adjourned. Thank you.